Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, today my guest is Jane Elliott, internationally known teacher, lecturer, diversity trainer, and recipient of the National Mental Health Association Award for Excellence in Education, exposing prejudice and bigotry for what it is, an irrational class system based upon purely arbitrary factors. And if you think this does not apply to you, you are in for a rude awakening. So let's go back a little ways. In response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. over 30 to 50 years ago, Jane Elliott devised a controversial and startling blue eyes, brown eyes exercise. This is now a famous exercise labels for participants as inferior and superior based solely upon the color of their eyes and exposes them to the experiences of being a minority. Everyone who is exposed to Jane Elliott's work, be it through a lecture, workshop, or video, is dramatically affected and changed. Stay tuned for the interview. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I have Jane Elliott on the line here on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. Jane, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I, I feel so blessed to have you on the well, show. Thank, thank you for thank you for inviting me to be on to be on your show. I think this is this is just a lovely compliment. Now. I followed you off and on like I followed you when I was younger. I didn't even know what it was about. And then as I grew older, because I was born in 1966 and your experiment with the blue eye, brown eye uh, experiment, that was in 1967, correct? It was in 1966. The first thing I did was in 1967, but nobody knew about it. So how did and no the day after no nineteen sixty eight the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed and you know this is what struck me as weird because you are a person I, I after seeing you 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 have strong conviction <laughs> and a strong personality yeah. but what made you move forward with it outside of that initial experiment number one it wasn't an experiment. What I do is separate people according to, on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they have absolutely no control. I assign negative traits to those that I have decided I'm going to use as the, as the bad guys for the day and keep and tell the, and make the others all right. That's not an experiment. It's what we do in this country with skin color all day every day. So if what I do is an experiment, then what we are doing in this country is an experiment. It's illegal. Yeah. It's unethical. And it ought to be stopped. So I don't experiment with third graders or with people of any age. I do an exercise in discrimination to give people the experience, the experience, not the experiment, but the experience of living for a few hours or even a few minutes walking in the shoes of another person's life. And I did it because Martin Luther King Jr. had been one of our heroes of the month in February, and he was dead at the hands of an assassin in April. And I knew the minute that, was, that I found out about that killing, that he wasn't killed because of racism. He was killed because he had run the, he had led the Poor People's March on Washington. And he was had, he had led a march with many, many white people in poverty. If he hadn't done the Poor People's March on Washington, he would still be alive today. But it was obvious that he and Malcolm X were getting closer and closer together in their philosophy. And if he and Malcolm X had gotten together with the people in poverty in this country, who are people of all colors, it would have turned this economy around in such a way that a whole lot of white folks would have been really uncomfortable. Wow. And I knew why he died. I knew why he was killed, and it had nothing to do with the color of his skin. It had to do with the the content of his desires. And his desire was to be treated like a fully functioning human being instead of like an animal, which is what we did. So I, had, to, I had no way to explain that to my third graders. They wouldn't have understood it. Uh-huh. But 
uh, great, great educator, John Dewey, said, we learn by doing. And I decided I was going to teach them how it felt to walk in the shoes of a black child in this country for a day in order for them in the future to remember how that felt and to refuse to go along with it. Now, black people are calling people who are aware of these things woke. Woke. Those kids got woke. They became woke on the first day of that exercise. And when we reversed it the second day, they never forgot what happened to them. To this day, they remember vividly what happened to them during that exercise. So, you, since then, you've been in contact with these partic- these children that were in your class? Right. And... Do they have? Are they paid it forward? Are they carrying on uh, the teachings that you have given them? Yes, yes, they are, and they are doing. They are doing things that their parents would never have expected them to do, and they have become people their parents would never have expected them to become. The year, the, the third year, I did the exercise. I, I did it the first time, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. The next year, I did it in October, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corp. Corporation film that you've never seen that film in this country. The third year I did it, the principal handed me my class role at the teacher conference meetings, teacher, uh, you know, whatever, beginning of the year. He handed me my class role and he said, Now, Miss Elliott, these kids are never going to learn to read. Pass them on and get them, out, get them out of here. They'll never amount to anything anyway. I know you get upset when students in your class don't learn to read. These kids aren't going to learn to read. Give them what you can, but don't expect too much of them. And I thought, You're an idiot. Because if he put those kids in my class, they were going to learn to read. That's what I do. I teach kids how to read. Yeah. So I went and looked at their cumulative files, and their high, their math scores were high, and their reading score, reading and spelling scores were dreadful. And I thought, okay, that's it. These kids are all moderately to severely dyslexic. I know how to teach the dyslexic child. I took a course at Orton Gillingham Phonics several years before those kids came into my classroom, and I know how to teach the dyslexic child. They came into my classroom reading at the upper first grade level. Some of them, some of them weren't at the upper first grade level. And I told them the first day of school, look kids, I know that you're a bright, smart group of kids who need to be taught a certain way. Let me show you what I know about this. And I put the word on on the board. I said, what's that word? Some of them said on, some of them said no, some of them said nothing. So then I erased that and put the word was on the board. I said, what's that? Some of them said was, some of them said saw, some of them said nothing. I said, now, the reason you say different things is your brains are wired differently. And sometimes you see a word backwards. So I'm going to teach you how to look at a word and figure out what it is by drawing your finger across that word so you see it, the word, the letters, in the right order. You're going to be reading at or above the fourth grade level when you leave here in May. And if you aren't, you're going to stay with me another year. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And some of them looked like, I'm going to learn to read. I don't want to be able to do with your mother here. And we commenced to learn to read. It was absolutely marvelous. Two of the kids in that film, The Eye of the Storm, had been identified by the Alba Crippled Children's Clinic as mentally retarded. There was no mental retardation in that room. One of them, one of the other students, had a language all her own. You couldn't understand the word she said. Another was a stutterer. When she came in, he'd start to say something. He'd say, Miss Valley, and then he'd go, uh, uh, and he'd sit down in frustration. By the time the film crew came to my classroom, and I think it was in February, I'm not sure, those, the stutterer had stopped stuttering. The person who had a language of her own was speaking so that you could understand her, and those kids, by the time they left me, were reading at the fourth to the sixth grade level. Some of their reading, their their um, individual, their private reading lessons, reading scores were at the sixth grade level. Wow! Those kids, there wasn't a defect, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, and there wasn't a mentally retarded child in that classroom. They had not been taught by people who know how to teach to that particular problem. And they said, when they left me, they said, we wish we could stay another year. And I said, yeah, kids, I wish you could, too. If I had had them for another year, I'd have left them at the end of fourth grade reading at the eighth grade level. (laughs) Because they were excited about learning. They were just, they were so excited about learning. They couldn't wait. You know, they'd come to school in the morning just grinning all over, like a bunch of little wiggly puppies, because we're going to learn something new today. We're going to do something fun today. And when they went up to fourth grade, 
some one of the one of the groups that came through films interviewed one of the fourth grade teachers, and she said, "I can always tell which students came out of Mrs. Elliott's classroom. They think learning is they think school is supposed to be fun. It takes two weeks to get them to sit down and take learning seriously." And I thought, "Oh, help me, Lord! Learning ought to be fun." Yeah. Learning to read ought to be fun. Learning to do math is like a puzzle that you can you can decipher if you know the rules. It ought to be fun, but no, you have to take learning seriously. You sit down and shut up and and just say yes, misses, and no, misses, and that's the way you learn. I believe John Dewey was right. Hey, prior to uh, us actually having uh, the recorded interview, I, I informed you that I was heading to Europe. And one of the things that I noticed as I've traveled back and forth to Europe is when I go to Europe, yeah, I see some differences because I'm a, a man of color, a very tall man of color. So I'm very noticeable. But what I notice more outside the United States is nationalism versus racism. Do you ever think that we can actually be just Americans in this country? Number one, let's try to remember that we are United States citizens. And then let's try to remember that everyone who lives from the northern tip of the North Pole to the southern tip of South America is an American. We, in our arrogance, think that we are the only Americans. <laughs> during the Second World War, yeah, during the Second World War, my, when my uncles were serving in the Second World War, particularly in the European theater of war, they came back and said, we really got into trouble over there with people from Venezuela and Mexico. That was a world war. There were people there from all over the world fighting that war. And our soldiers would say, well, we're Americans. And then a Mexican would speak up and say, I'm an American, too. I come from Central America. Somebody else would say, I come from South America. We're all Americans. Canadians would say, we're Americans. But see, we in this country have decided that America is only the contiguous 48 states. It's crazy. We should start referring to ourselves as, as United States citizens, particularly, particularly if we are determined that we have to keep those people from south of the border out of here. Now, Donis I'm not going to call him Donosaurus T. Rump. I'm going to call him Donald Trump because he prefers that, but that doesn't really describe it. We need to realize that when he puts up a wall, on the southern border of this country, he is keeping Americans out of this country. I don't think we ever think about that. In fact, I know we don't ever think about that. You don't, now, no, what was your question? No one, no one's ever actually said that, and you've made me rethink my position. So, in the in the contiguous United States of America, do you think we could ever be a one an identified group who lives within those? 48 or 50 states as just people versus Mexican, uh, Arab American. I, I want it to be more. I want it to be more than just within these 50 states. I want it to be worldwide. I want everyone to recognize worldwide that there's only one race, the human race, and we're all members of it. We have been conditioned to believe the myth of four, three or four different races, and it's a lie. It was a myth made up by those who had fought the Spanish and who had um, <coughs> ran the Spanish Inquisition. They needed a new way to de identify who they were going to conquer, who they were going to kill, and who they were going to exploit. So instead of using religion, they settled on skin color. Now, it's as simple as that. Previous to that, there was no racism. There were just different color groups. But we deliberately created racism in, the, in about 500 years ago, and we have perpetuated it to this day. To believe that there are four or five different races is as ignorant as the Greeks were when they believed that the sun was a god in a golden chariot that goes across the sky every morning. <laughs> it's a myth. That is. We have been misled in this country for, in this country as a country, for 250 years. But on this land, we have been mis misled for about 500 years. It's time for a stop to it. We can stop racism if we stop thinking about there being four or five different races. There's only one. You and I are cousins. You may not like that, but that's the way it, ought, that's the way it is. Every person on this earth is a 30th to 50th cousin of every other person on this earth because we all are descendants of those first black females 
who evolved in sub-Saharan Africa about 280,000 years ago. And because those black people were so adventurous and so bright and so courageous, they went from sub-Saharan Africa all over the world without any sextants, without any technology. They went to every corner of this earth and populated this earth. Now, obviously, those who went to northern European climates produced less melanin, so their skins got lighter and lighter. They, didn't, they weren't as dark as those who stayed near the equator. People who went to Asia, those black folks who went to Asia, their skins are a different hue, number one, because of their diet. Skin color is a matter of adaptation to the natural environment. It has nothing to do with being God's chosen children. And we white folks, we white folks have a few problems. One of the major differences between white people and other color groups on this earth is when white people come into a new environment, they immediately adjust the environment to fit their needs. (laughs) When people of color come into a new environment, they immediately adjust their needs to fit the environment. And we white folks have done that even with God. We have made God look like an old white man with a long gray beard who looks like Charles and Heston playing Moses. Nothing could be farther from the truth. God is a spirit and has neither gender nor color. But we made, we white folks made somebody that we can relate to. And we made God look like us. It's ridiculous. And that's absolutely true because when I was a kid, uh, my mom made me go to Catholic schools and I kept, first of all, here's my contradiction. I kept, I remember the 10 commandments that says you should not worship any images yet. When I went into church, all I saw was statues that we had to bow down, pray to pray to this one, pray to that one, that saint, that this, that, and the other. And the biggest and there's a white Jesus hanging on the cross. <laughs> yes, this is me in the, in the city of Detroit in the 70s and 80s. And I was just like, there's something that just doesn't fit here. And it wasn't. Which makes no sense. It, it may not. Go ahead. But it, for me, it, what happened was I moved from the inner city, which was predominantly people of color and people were telling me all the time, Hey Emmett, you know what? You're a minority. And I'm like, I don't understand what you're talking about because everyone I see is literally like me. And I don't mean looks like me. I mean, they have my same culture because I had kids. I had kids who were, who were blonde hair, blue eyed, but we all played together. We had the same swag because we were from the same environment. It wasn't until I moved out to the suburbs that I start seeing what they were talking about. And as an adult male, I really see it now in the post Obama era. So, oh my God. And here we are in the post Obama era now saying, well, this is a post racial society. It <laughs> is not a post racial society. Racism is stronger now than it was before we killed Martin Luther King Jr. Because at that time, people were fighting racism. Now, they're fighting anti-racism. Oh. We elected a man who is a racist. He, we, we didn't elect a man. We elected a boy grown tall who is a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, an ethnocentrist, and as a result of that, there are more hate groups in the United States today than there have ever been before. You ought to take a look at that hate group map, map on your computer. It'll make you sick to see how they have increased in number since the election of this man. Let me ask you this question, because I've heard this in some debates and conversations that I've had with people, and particularly that white men are afraid of being annihilated genetically. Do you think that is really playing deep into it or a subpart that's playing deep into it? Because there are a lot more no, what, couples who what, are. What, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What, go on. What are you saying? Because there are a lot more couples who are, uh, who are fair and light, fair and dark. Like for instance, my wife is from Austria, and I'm from Detroit. And there are a lot more couples, or a lot, a lot of children, who are what we would term um, the product of a biracial couple. Do you think that's a factor well, which, too? Which of your which of these kids' parents 
came from outer space, these biracial kids. Which of them are aliens? Their parents are aliens. Neither. Well, then you can't call them biracial. Because there's only one race on the face of the earth, and it's the human race. You've got to give up that idea of biracial or multiracial. That's nonsense. If you want to talk about mosaic, that makes good sense, because a mosaic is something that is composed of many different elements and is quite new. These are mosaic families. Mosaic families are what started this continent. But we don't want to admit that. We don't, we don't dare admit that. And I think what white men are afraid of is the lo- loss of their power. They also know that within 30 years, white people will have become a numerical minority in the United States of America. They know that. And they're scared to death. And every time I do a presentation to anybody, any, any group, somebody says, well, aren't they going to do to us what we've done to them if they get on top? I say, wait a minute. When you say what we've done to them, that indicates to me that you know exactly what you've been doing. And you know that they know what you've been doing. Now, if you don't want to be treated in the future the way you have treated them, that big word them, in the past, all you have to do is change the way you treat them in the present. Because what you do in the present creates the future. Now, I think white men, of course, if you haven't read Killers of the Dream... Uh, and I can't remember the author's name, but everybody should read the book Killers of the Dream because the woman who wrote it describes how this myth about the virility of black males came about. It is just an amazing story, and everybody should read that book. It's extremely, extremely important because if you did, that would explain to you why, what it is that white males are afraid of and where it came from and why we need to put a stop to it. Furthermore, <laughs> if white people want to have their grandchildren live a long life, a grandchild who lives a long life, you'd better start thinking about mosaic, a mosaic marriage because, because of the, the damage we've done to the ozone layer, more and more sunlight is being allowed to pierce our skins here. And unless you have plenty of melanin in your skin in the future, you're going to have, we're going to have increased numbers, increased cases of skin cancer. And melanoma can kill you. Now it's a matter of self, you know, if you're going to live, it's a matter of self-preservation to appreciate those who don't look like you. This whole thing now is going to come full circle. But you see, we've had presidents who were advised by people like Ben Wattenberg over the last 30 years. And in 1987, Ben Wattenberg, who was a brilliant Jewish man, an advisor to presidents of the United States and a member of the American Enterprise Institute, wrote a book called The Birth Dearth. And the first sentence in the first paragraph of that book said, the main problem concerning the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country today. If we don't fix this and fix it soon, white people will be in the numerical minority and this will no longer be a white man's land. I was furious with the first paragraph. But I thought, I've got to finish this. He can't possibly mean this. He's going to apologize for this. So I read it. He said, there are three things we can do to take care of this problem. Number one, we could pay women to have babies, as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Then he says, and these are his words, not mine. Unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, and we don't want to do that. He says, the second thing we could do is allow, uh, increase the number of immigrants, illegal immigrants that are allowed into this country every year. Then he says... Unfortunately, the vast majority of those wanting to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. He says the third thing we could do is remember that 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Now think about that, and think about what has been suggested in the last 20 years about how we're going to solve our demographic problem. One of the things we're going to do is build a wall to keep those brown-skinned people out because they reproduce too rapidly. They will outnumber us. And we have already closed up a whole lot of Planned Parenthood clinics because we're quite certain that all you learn there is how to have an abortion. We don't think about all the other things that women, the advantages that women have as a result of Planned Parenthood clinics. I talked about that at a college a couple of months ago. And there were two boys, when they were boys, wearing their red caps that say, Make America Great Again. 
And when I was done talking, they said, can we talk to you? And I said, sure. So we went downstairs, and he said, no. One of them, they're two brothers. And the oldest one said, you've got your t- statistics wrong. I said, what statistics do I have wrong? He said, you said that 60% of the fetuses that were aborted every year are white. That's not true. I said, what are your statistics? He said, 39% of the aborted fetuses are white, and 61% are fetuses of other colors. I said, you just proved my point, my friend. Because since 1987, we have tried to do away with Planned Parenthood clinics. We have tried to, we're trying to do away with a woman's right to choose. And as a result of that, look what we have done to the statistics. Down from 60% to 39%. I'd say that we're accomplishing our goal. Wouldn't you? And he looked at me and he gave me the strangest look. He said, I didn't think of it that way. I said, of course you didn't, sir, white male. You didn't think of it that way. Think of it that way. Is it working? He said, well, yeah, I guess it must be. He learned a lot in that moment. And by the time he left, he was saying, what should I do about this cap? I said, here's what you should do about that cap. Get a new one that says, Trump says, make America hate again. Ooh, that's a good one. Because that's what make America great again is all about. That's wanting to go back, as Ronald Reagan did, to the 50s, which were really good for white males. Weren't worth a darn for the rest of us. Wow. You know, and this is why I was so excited to talk to you, because you make people think, which is more than I can say for much of what's exposed, uh, what people are exposed to nowadays, especially with all this uh, connectivity 24 hours a day. People are, are not really thinking. They're just going on the surface of what they see. And a lot of what they see they is perpetrated. And by they don't media. know anything about history. They don't realize that the things that Donald Trump wants to be done, Donald Trump and his cohorts, he's not alone in this, want to be done, are very reminiscent of the things that Hitler wanted to do. And nobody wants to say, nobody, at the minute you say, well, they say, well, now that's an exaggeration, this isn't at all like that. Oh, yes, it is. When you turn people against one another, and when you start your campaign by saying, all Mexicans are thugs and rapists and murderers, and when you, when you say Muslims can't, the awful things he has said about Muslims, I have a problem with that. I have two granddaughters who are half Saudi Arabian, half Anglo-American, and they are Muslims. And you'd better re- believe that they are not going to move my Muslim daughter, granddaughters out. He, that when you have a group who are preaching hate and divisiveness, and it's working with 30% of the population, this is very Hitlerite. He knows exactly what somebody knows, exactly what to tell him what to do. I don't think that Mr. Trump knows what to do. I think somebody is telling him exactly what to do in order to conquer, the, in, to destroy this democracy. Um, Mr. Bannon said during an interview on television several months ago, we have to deconstruct this government. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're deconstructing the government of the United States. And I want to know what you think they're going to put in its place. If you think things are ugly for people of color now, wait until we deconstruct this government. Because this is going to be a white man's government. And the rest of us better just shut up and go along to get along. I won't do that. And the rest of everybody has to say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. This is not going to happen again in my lifetime. Let me ask you this point. So we have a constituency that's 50% of this globe, which is females. And... I see a lot. It's more than fifty percent. Yeah, yeah. It's more than fifty percent. <laughs> you know, you're abs- you're absolutely right. <laughs> but I, I have a I have a whole spiel about that, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why aren't more women up in arms about these the the situation and the treatment of people in general, um, considering where women's suffrage has come from? in the early 20th century? Because we have, right right now in this country, we are being more and more run by evangelical Christianity. And if you want Sharia law, all you have to do is push evangelical Christianity. Now, I'm a Christian, a practicing Christian. I'm going to keep on practicing until I get it right. I don't have it right yet, but I'm working on it. But 
If you haven't read Frank Schaefer's books about evangelical Christianity, you'd better get them and read them. Patience with God, if you haven't read that book, get it and read it. Frank Schaefer's father, Franklin Schaefer, started the evangelical movement in the U.K., and Frank Schaefer learned it and brought it to this country. And now he says, stay away from evangelical Christianity. It has been twisted to an extent that you would not recognize it from what his father taught him. We are trying to take this country back 50, a good 50 years, more than that, 60 years, so that where women know their place and stay in their place and men rule the world. And if you don't think I'm telling the truth about that, then you watch Vice President Pence. You watch the things he's talking about. You watch the things he wants to happen. This is a scary little man. And I don't think people realize what that man is all about. Yeah, I'm, the United I'm States familiar voted with that Pence. We should, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, and the things he's doing are, are absolutely unacceptable in a democracy. So what do you do? Instead of changing what he's doing, you change the government so it's no longer a democracy. Wow. You know, I don't think people have really thought of it on that level for some odd reason, and I don't understand this myself. I saw all the... I saw all the... We are encouraged not to think, you know. It's it's like Julius Caesar. That man is dangerous. He thinks too much. (laughs) We have encouraged people not to think. And if you don't think we have, then you need to go out to dinner sometime and look around you. And at most of the tables, there will be people with their... If they're there, if they're there with their children, each of their children has a cell phone in his hand, his or her hand, and are playing some kind of a game on that cell phone. Those families aren't eating together. They are eating, but they are all, and the parents, too, have cell phones out. I sat down in California a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, and went into a restaurant, sat down to eat, and here's a family of six. Six people and six cell phones. Nobody was communicating with anybody else. They weren't even texting to one another. They were playing a game on their cell phone or talking to somebody who wasn't there. (laughs) <laughs> if there's a book that everybody, yes, yeah, there's a book that everybody should read. I'm reading it now, and it's called The Dumbest Generation. Everybody should read that book because it talks about the fact that we are we are watering down education. We are putting kids on cell phones. We're letting them play video games instead of teaching them anything. And the author's name is Mark B A U E R L E I N. It looks like Bower Lane the dumbest generation and that's what we're raising right now aren't you glad you called oh i you have no idea <laughs> you, I, i'm gonna tell it to you like this see this is how i know how powerful humans are because i have been just kind of consuming all of your stuff over the course of the last week i had no idea i was going to be able to talk to you but i got so excited and i was just consuming consuming i said i have to speak to this woman if it's one of the last things i do and i just well i hope it isn't (laughs) i hope so too and i went to your way and i just said let me try and sometimes you just have to try things that you think are far-fetched because to me you're a celebrity you're 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 i hold you in high esteem so you think to yourself, I'll never be able to contact this person, but all you have to do is try. And you answered the phone and it and I almost dropped the phone out my <laughs> <laughs> Most usually people call me and they'll say, Are you still alive? <laughs> and I say, No, I'm not. I'm a figment of your imagination. Don't worry about it. Well, I thought you'd be dead by now. Well, if some of the people who disagree with what I do had their way, I would be dead by now. And when I go to a college campus, there are usually three fraternity boys about the third row back, and they're talking while I am, and I know what they're talking about. So I say, fellas, I know what you're talking about. You want me dead because of what I do to decrease the level of racism in this country. Now, if you shoot me because I'm doing that, you might make a martyr out of me, and you might have to spend the rest of your life celebrating Jane Elliott Day once a year. Now, do you want to do that? (laughs) And then they go, no, 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 and they make a cross with their purse fingers, you know, and hang it, hold it up. And the rest of the audience is just howling because they know what those guys are thinking. They know what they're talking about. And they know that it'd be really dumb. And I say to them, keep me alive on your campus, fellas. You don't want to be blamed for what could happen if you shoot me here. 
and they look like, oh, no, no, we'll, we'll keep you alive. Don't you worry. And I think, I wasn't worried. I don't worry about that anymore. I get so many death threats, so it's kind of like when I turn on my, my uh, email, my iPad, if there isn't a death threat on there, I haven't, that I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> I mean, you still get death threats after all this time? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you see, I'm new to a whole bunch of people. Everybody under the age of 21, most of them, have never heard of me. And if you have been in the school system in this country, which we talk about, um, in which we claim we are engaged in education, but we are really engaged in indoctrination, teaching young people how to be good, good American citizens, and you hear somebody like me saying, well, wait a minute, the United States is doing this and this and this wrong. And furthermore... <laughs> I am a member of the I am a member of the free. When you talk about the land of the free and the home of the brave, I'm the free. Black women are the brave. And when anybody gets up on his soapbox and calls young black athletes sons of bitches because they are not saluting the flag properly, I get really, really angry. And I say things that make other people really angry. So, yeah, people disagree with me, and they'd like to disagree with me by seeing me dead. That would be a really dumb thing for anybody to do. Yeah. It, that they, it was really, they, they killed Martin Luther King Jr., but nothing can stop a man with a dream. His dream is more alive now than it was while he was alive. And nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. The idea of one race, the human race, is an idea whose time has come. And nothing, nothing, and no one is going to be able to stop it. And that includes Dinosaurus T. Rump and all his underlings. <laughs> you know, I, I think this country is going through a severe cognitive dissidence, particularly when it comes to Colin Kaepernick and his stance and the football players who are making a stance. People are ignoring the cause and focusing in on the action because of who it is. Is there any way they aren't we can ignoring it? They're it? denying it. They're denying it. Somebody has said denial is not just a river in Egypt. Denial is what white people go through in this country on a daily basis. If they keep on denying the presence of racism in this society, then they don't have to do anything about it. But the minute they agree that yes, this is a racist society then they have to do something because they are responsible for either perpetuating it or destroying it. And we have the ability to destroy it. We created racism. Anything you create, you can destroy. We could destroy racism if we decided to educate instead of indoctrinate. Hmm. And don't tell me that Mr. Trump is the person to decide whether someone is patriotic enough. A patriot doesn't refuse to go to war and get deferment after deferment after deferment to see to that he doesn't have to do that. A patriot doesn't get the Medal of Freedom from the Russians or give the medal of, or do the kinds of things with the Russians that this man has done. A patriot doesn't refuse to pay, pay his taxes while those of us who have no power have to pay ours. When we're talking when we're talking about somebody who is defending the flag. That man will wrap himself in the flag, and a lot of racists will wrap themselves in the flag in order to avoid discussing what the real problem is in this country. And when you bring it up, somebody will say, you're playing the race card again. Let me tell you about that. The deck that we are given to play with in this country is a racist deck. <laughs> Every card in that deck is a racist card. Start using something besides a racist deck, and nobody will play the race card. But if you play a card about education, about religion, about sexuality, about economics, about any, any, anything in this country, you will find that in the, at the best basis of it, there is a racist intent. Don't tell me about the race card until you change the deck. Yeah. You See know, why people I, hate me? I deal with it daily. <laughs> Would you like to kill me? <laughs> <laughs> No, I deal with it. I see it more now that I'm over 50 than I did before. But it depends. I mean, I, and a lot of it is where I'm located versus where I was previously, because I was in a metropolitan area and it wasn't so obvious, subversively obvious as it is now, where I've moved to this very 
rural area where there's not a great deal of diversity and it's so subtle it was and i had an incident a couple of weeks ago with someone that i know have known for a couple of years but we were watching this uh that fight between conor mcgregor and uh i can't think of his name now but all of a sudden uh, this guy seems to have forgotten i was in the room and he just yelled out the huh this n-word and i was like we got to go baby yep yep oh yeah oh yeah i remember when cooney remember you don't remember jerry cooney i remember was him. A great white hope several years yeah and the night he lost i watched my son and his uh, his buddies who run big big equipment watch that fight two weeks after it was fought and they all knew how it ended but for the first few rounds, they sat there and they told, told that Cooney what to do to that SOB and all that N-word and all that. And we were in Texas watching. And my son had said, Mom, you keep a low profile tonight. Now, these guys are going to be here. I said, I won't say a word, Brian. And I listened to those fools. And the round before he was going to get knocked out, those guys said, let's go play some cards. And they went out in the kitchen and played cards so they wouldn't have to watch the great white hope get knocked out. <laughs> so what, It was just... So do you think... It was just a scream. Do you think it's going to change? What's going to be the tipping point that, that makes us correct ourselves so that we can live as human beings versus these segregated people, groups? Pe people are going to start seeing that we're all members of the same race. That's the way it is. In the DNA of every human being living on the face of the earth today runs the memory of those first black women's DNA. We are all members of the same race. We are different color groups. We are different cultural groups. We are different religious groups. We are, we are different in lots and lots of ways, but at the basis, we are all descendants of those first black females. And when we start teaching us, treating each other like cousins instead of like enemies, we can change this thing around. We have to do this if this world is, if this earth is going to continue to exist as a planet that will support life. What we are doing to this planet right now, in the name of progress, and in the name, and particularly here in Iowa, which has now been declared a sacrifice zone, they are willing to sacrifice the state of Iowa with some of the finest farmland on earth to hog farm, hog confinements. And they know that since we've got, we've got six million hogs being raised in confinement on, in this state to date, and they know that the manure from those hogs, when they drill it into the soil, goes down into the soil, down to the water table, and practically every water, every, every body of water in the state of Iowa is contaminated due to hog confinements. But our former governor, Terry Branstead, said we can have unlimited hog confinements in this state because this is an agricultural state. He did it for money. And now he is in China as an ambassador to China, appointed by Don Source Trump, to teach the Chinese how to be successful in hog confinements in China. If you don't if you haven't heard about what's going on with Iowa Select and their hog confinements, you ought to look into it, because we are willing to sacrifice the state of Iowa to the need for some people to have more money than they have now. And it isn't farmers that are getting the major share of that money. It's the corporations that are getting the major share of that money. Yeah, you know what's Isn't funny a scary time in Iowa? Is I was in Iowa because I work in the solar industry. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an educator in the solar industry, and I troubleshoot. And a great deal of these hog farms have solar, which is which is weird now that you say this, because they're doing a good thing on one hand, but then they're doing a really bad thing on the backside of it because they have. And I've literally seen these pools where all the runoff waste from these uh, containments, literally, it, it's crazy. It, it will. It will yeah, it is. And the smell is ungodly. The smell is just. There are four within two miles south of my house. When the wind is in the south, I have to keep my windows closed Oof. because the smell is so bad. And now they're finding that those, you know, that smell isn't just smell. That smell is teeny, tiny, tiny, minuscule particles of hog manure floating in the air. 
do people think there's a the reason that's just that's just odor? No, it's not. And it's like when you sneeze. Can you sneeze out tiny particles of your what's in your lungs and your throat? That hog manure is tiny, tiny particles of manure, and we're breathing that in. This is absolutely un this you cannot support human life if you are spending all your time and money in construction constructing hog confinements. I'm a little, more than a little upset about this. But it's about money. Really, the only color that really matters in this country anymore is green, the color of our money. We'll do anything to make more money. Now, it's hard to eat money, and when push comes to shove, we might find that out. If you ruin the land so that you can't grow the crops you need to because you're using GMOs, genetically modified organisms, to grow crops, and then you feed that to your hogs, and then you feed the meat from those hogs to people, what do you suppose happens to people? And I don't think anybody's thinking about that. All they're thinking about is, let's make some more money. Can I, can I tell you something about, I go to visit my in-laws in Austria, and I'm usually there about two weeks at a time. Austria is the only place where I've eaten four meals a day, which contain meat and a lot of bread and lost weight. And I come back here and I have to eat vegetarian just to maintain my health. <laughs> hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. Because I think if you check, you find out that maybe Austria is like several other countries in which they will not allow GMOs come into their country. Yeah, they don't. They don't at all. Yeah, yes, it makes a, makes a huge difference. And it's going to take the United States a long time to learn that lesson because there's money involved. That's too bad. I wish you had been with me on night before last. I wish I would have been with you, I too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what you were doing. I don't want to know. But I had a tall white male and a tall, black, beautiful female stand up beside me while we talked about differences, because we're into saying now, we should ignore differences and talk about how we're all alike. Similarities, similarities are more important than differences. So I said to the audience, let me show you how that works. So I had this tall, white male stand beside me and this tall, black woman. I said, now do you folks see any differences here? And, of course, the first one they say is height, because I, I set him up. Height. So I asked the man if his height is important to him. Well, not really. I said, well, you, would you rather be your height or mine? He said, well, mine. I said, well, then, now let's get back to the point where you're going to tell me the truth. Is your height important to me? Well, I guess it is. Did you earn it? No. Is it a physical character characteristics over which you have no control? Yes. Does it give you power? Well... I guess it does. I said, does it give you power? Yes, it does. I said, thank you. Ask the black woman the same question. She's tall, as tall as he was, but her height doesn't give her power. So then we dealt with gender, and his gender gives him power. Hers doesn't give her power. Her, his, uh, his age gives him power. Hers doesn't give her power. The worst thing you can do as a woman is get over 45. Um, then, he, then, then finally somebody said, color. And I said, are you talking about hair color or skin color? They said, skin color. I said, is your skin color important to you for the white guy? He said, well, well, yeah, I guess it is. I said, did it give you power? Yes. Did you earn it? No. Is it physical characteristic over which you have no control? Yes. Did you power? Yes. I asked the black woman the same question. No, that her skin color doesn't give her power. Her skin color robs her of power because people look down on her, even though they have to look up to her because she's so tall and so absolutely gorgeous. So then I said to the man, are you free to do whatever you want to do, go wherever you want to go, say whatever you want to say as long as you stay within the confines of the law? He said, well, yes, I am. I said, you're free, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. I said to the black woman, sometimes it takes courage for you to get out of bed in the morning. And she looked at me and she said, yes, it does. I said, why? And she said, I have not said this before, but I have two daughters, and I prayed when I was pregnant that I wouldn't have a son, because I knew what he would probably have to go through, and that I would probably lose him at a young age. And by then, there was a tear running down the left side of her face. And I turned to the audience, and I said, do you see what you've done? Do you see what you've done and what you've denied? How dare you? Practically every man on the face of the earth wants his, the woman he chooses or by whom he has chosen to produce a son so that the family name will be carried forward. That black woman didn't dare have a son 
because she knew what would happen to him if she did. Those people learn more in that three minutes than I taught them in three hours. Wow. She was crying. Every black woman in the room was crying. The man beside, this tall white male beside me was sniffling and wiping his eyes. And everybody in the room was just gobsmacked by what they had just heard. A totally honest response from that black female in a place where she felt comfortable and safe to say it. Now, we've got to create safe places for people to talk about what's really happening instead of having to pretend that it's all right when some poor white woman says to you, when I see you, I don't see you black. You do not have to say, thank you, ma'am, thank you very much. And when somebody says, I just look for the person tired, you don't have to say, thank you, ma'am, thank you very much. You have to say, if you can see my heart from where you're sitting, you should get down to the hospital and volunteer to be their x-ray machine because you can save them a lot of money. If you can see what's inside a person without, without, without a special instrument, <laughs> I am so sick. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget, I'm standing in a downtown hotel in Denver, Colorado, with aggressive, abrasive Linda Gillery, black Linda Gillery. And this fool white woman diddled up, sir, diddled up to her with her silly little shoes because she's wearing on high heels, you know, so she has to walk on her tiptoes, can't walk real well anyway, <laughs> and says to Linda Gillery, Linda, when I see you, I don't see you black. I stepped back and I thought, oh, God, there's going to be bloodshed here. I've got to wear this suit tomorrow. I've got to do this again tomorrow. I don't want this thing all bloody. And Linda Gillery looked down at that fool and said, I think we should get make an appointment with the optometrist because you obviously have a sight problem. <laughs> that woman ran away from her even faster than she had run up. Mm. And I'll bet from now on that she will not say to a black person, when I see you, I don't see you black. And when some woman says to me, and it's usually white women who do these things because they are conditioned to think it's all right, they'll say to me, I don't see color, I'm colorblind. When one of them says that to me, I say, well, I knew that before you said it, because if you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't dye your hair that color. And if you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't be wearing that shirt with those pants. And then they get away from me just as fast as they can, because their whole vocabulary has been put in question. Yeah. Do you really not see color, or are you so upset by a black person standing in front of you that you have to deny what you see has a negative element in that person, which is the color of their skin. How ignorant are we, and how long are we going to continue to be ignorant? Skin color is natural. Nobody says to me, when I see you, I don't see you white. But I say that to other people, because this man last this man this week said, I'm, I'm a white man. I said, oh, are you? And I, I wear a white sweatshirt all the time, with the words on it, prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. And I held my white sweatshirt up against his hand, and I said, which of these things is white? Well, he says, I guess I guess the shirt is, I said, I guess it is. What would you say your skin color is? Well, I don't know. I said, well, it's either pink or light brown. It sure isn't white. Wow. But we use, we explain things as being white privilege. No. White folks love to be told that they're privileged. And then they can say, I didn't ask for this privilege. It's time for them to, it's time to, for us to identify this as, as what it really is, which is white ignorance. If you are over the age of 15 and you are still believing in the rightness of whiteness, that is self-imposed ignorance because there are lots of books out there that tell you that what you are believing is a myth. We've been misled long enough. If anybody hasn't read The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman, they've made a mistake. Everybody in this country should read that book yesterday. And if they haven't read Nathan Rutstein's The Racial Conditioning of Our Children, to which the the uh, subtitle is Ending Psychological Genocide in Our Schools. If you haven't read that book, you better get it and read it. And if you don't know that black people were here before Columbus, you better read Ivan Van Sertima's They Came Before Columbus. And then if you think everything started with Jesus, you need to read the Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Browder. Because you'd find out that there were thousands of years of people believing in a God before Jesus was born. Hundreds of thousands of years. But white folks think history started with us. It's got news for them. 
Yeah, there's a book that I've been trying to find, and it is when I saw it on Amazon, and I can't remember the name of it off. But it was about the Moors. But the, go to go to the Tattered Cover Bookstore in Denver, Colorado. Bring them up on your computer, and then send them an email and ask them if they could find that book for you. And they usually can find the books that I want. They're absolutely remarkable. Really? They find, yeah, they find uh, books that are out of print, and they buy them, evidently they buy them up from libraries, and put them in, uh, store them someplace. I got the most marvelous book. Uh, it doesn't matter what the name it is, but it was one I read when I was a teenager, and I always wanted to read it, reread it, so I called Tattered Cover Bookstore, and they got the book for me. Yeah, so I, I would try Tattered Cover Bookstore. I just bookmarked the site. Because uh, I have to go to Denver every infrequently, but frequently enough that I can, I can make that happen. Or I while you're can... there, if you if you go to the Tattered Cover Bookstore, see if you can get the book "The Birth Dearth" by Ben Wattenberg. And if you can get multiple copies of it, buy them, and I will buy them from you. Wait a minute. What did you say the name of the book is again? The Birth Dearth. B i r t h d e a r t h, which means too few births. The Birth Earth by Ben Wattenberg, W-A-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. The man was brilliant, but misled. And also, there's a book that everybody listening to this, if there's anybody still listening, ought to read. And it's called, just a minute, because I have, I bought seven copies of it this week. It's called On Tyranny by Timothy Schneider. Everybody needs to read that book. It's 127 pages of information that you need to challenge the Trump agenda. And the Trump agenda is a racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic agenda, ethnocentric agenda. You need to read this book to know how to challenge it. It It's absolutely remarkable. Man, I just need to call. I just need to call you every once in a while just to get my book list together. I'm sorry, but like, hey, hey Jay, what are you, you reading this week? Just, <laughs> well, you don't learn by just thinking. You have to learn by reading what other people are thinking. Because they think better than I do. And they know more than I do. And they know more history than I do. And I've got to get the book that, that was on television last night. Um, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell interviewed somebody who wrote, who wrote this book last night. And the name of it is, and what the name of that book, Mary, that I said I have to get... The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. 27 psychologists and psychiatrists analyze Donald Trump. You've got to read it. It's, I'm, I have it ordered. I'll, I'll, it'll probably get here tomorrow. And then I'll be even more vicious. I have a question for you here. and It's one of the last ones because we're hitting toward the hour mark. And I know that when I release the podcast, people don't listen past an hour. So where are you appearing and what are you working on now out in the public? Out in public, I'm going to be at the, Air, the University of Arizona, Northern Arizona or someplace in a couple of a couple weeks. Did you say you but I don't tell everybody going? where I'm going. I don't tell everybody where I'm going because then they're waiting for me. Yeah. Yeah, and I am, I'm not going to, I don't mind dying, but I'm not going to commit suicide. <laughs> and I don't put my, my schedule up on the net. If you want to call me or you want to see me, you know where to find me. But... Um, you have, you'd have to make an effort to kill me if, if you have to come to my house. But if you know where I'm going, then you can meet me there. No, that's not going to happen. And I know that sounds melodramatic, but you haven't, you haven't been where I'm going. <laughs> wow. You know, you I'm, been where I've been. I just looked up this book. <laughs> I've, I've, and it's, what? I just looked up this book, The Birth Dearth. And you know it's the birth an, yeah you know it's an important book when the price of it starts at 150 bucks. Right, that's the same thing with the Nathan Rupstein book, and both of those are extremely volatile pieces of literature, and so they've got them so high that most people can't afford them. And that's why you need to go to the Tattered Cover Bookstore. You might be able to get them there at a lower price. And it, I'd appreciate it if you read the book A Collar in My Pocket, which I wrote which is a description of how white people of every age and every gender and every gender sexual orientation behave when they are treated for a few minutes or a few hours the way we treat people of color in this country for a lifetime. 
people need to read how white folks react to that. Not one word of that book is fictional. It's all about what I've experienced doing the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise with children of all ages, from the age of 5 to 79. And white folks all act the same. They cannot take for 15 minutes what we expect black people particularly to put up with in this country for a lifetime. And they know that their mothers and their grandmothers and their great-grandmothers and their great-great-grandmothers put up with the same thing. And so were their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren if something isn't done to change this situation. White people have the power to change this situation. They best start doing it now before they are forced to do it by being a minority. Yeah. When people go through the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, the blue-eyed people find out how it feels to be a minority for an hour and a half, and they cannot take it. I've been hit by a white male during this exercise. Adult white males. I've had a knife pulled on me. They took me out of Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Three carloads of blacks did because the teachers that I had put through the exercise in a very informal way in the morning called the superintendent in the afternoon and said, if you don't get that bitch out of town, we're going to shoot her. <laughs> So those blacks got me out of town. Now, some people hearing the word bitch get really upset about it. It used to bother me a lot. It doesn't anymore. For me, bitch is an acronym for being in total control, honey. Uh, and when women are seen in control, they are automatically called the B word. Hey, I want to ask you one last question before we go, because this has been struggling to get forth in the back of my mind. What did you think about Tupac Shakur in this modern age, because he was rallying a lot of people as well before he was taken off this planet. How dare he rally a lot of people? That's what happened to Tupac Shakur. How dare he rally a lot of people? You can't, you can't do that. You can do it if you're a white person. You can, get, you can get elected president if you're a white person. But if you're a black person and you get elected president, well, that, rem- that reminds me, who was our first black president? Do you remember? I can't remember the name right off the top of my head, and I know it. Does the name Does the name Abraham Lincoln mean anything to you? N- not really. Oh, well, he was our first black president. I, Abraham I, Lincoln was a Melungeon. He was part white, he was part black, and he was part Cherokee Indian. And he came from that place in that little area in Kentucky where there were a lot of Melungeons. And now those have moved to Texas. But Abraham Lincoln was our first black president. Now, can you imagine what the reaction to Republicans is going to be when they called their party the party of Lincoln and realized that he was part black and part Cherokee Indian? Do you think they're going to be changing their, their, the name of their party from the party of Lincoln to the party of something else? <laughs> Well, this would be interesting. You just got too much science for people to understand. I mean, I, I could just imagine. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Over the course of the next, actually for the rest of my life and yours, every once in a while, I am going to call you and ask you, where are you, how are you doing, and where can I see you? How's that? Well, that would be fine. Wherever I am, I'll let you, I'll be right here where I am now most of the year, and the rest of the time I'll be in Sun City, California. Because I can't stand Iowa winters. Well, I could, but my husband was had a bad heart, and the doctor said he has to be. I have to be housebound three months a year because if he goes outside, the cold air will kill him. Well, I knew if he was housebound with me three months a year, I'd kill him. So we got a little house in California, and that's keep laughing. And that's where I go. He's no longer with me. He died, he died four years ago, which I can't stand, but I will. I will, because I have to, but um, I live in California and in the wintertime, and I'm here in the summertime, so you call me, and I'll have the same telephone number no matter where I go. Well, I, you have no idea how I just appreciate your spirit, I appreciate your intellect, and I appreciate your passion. Well, I appreciate your still being alive. Uh, yeah, that's a good yeah. one. That's, you- that's real. Yeah, and you must have had a mother who helped you to stay there. Oh, she my was My heroes so are black women. She was right. so strong. My heroes are black women. I will never forget that black woman who said yesterday, day before yesterday, I prayed not to have a son. Hmm. And how many black women do that and then have a son anyway and watch something ugly happen to him because of the ignorance of people who see 
skin color as a negative. So I'm going to ask you this one last question. So if you were... You said that before. I'm, I know, but you're, I just can't get away from you. You know, you're just magnetic. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> if you were on television and they said, okay, we're only going to broadcast this one thing throughout all of our television channels and everybody in the entire Americas was watching you. And, they, and you had a message. They said, we have a very important message from Jane Elliott. And you would say... And you have like 15 seconds to say it. What would you tell everybody? I'd say, every one of you is the descendant of the first black female that you be on this earth. Now turn to the person beside you and say, hello, cousin. That was... Because that's what they are. Every person on this earth is a 30th to 50th cousin of every other person on this earth. That's what I'd say. And they'd be gobsmacked. Because we don't ever say that. There's only one race. It's the human race, and you are all members of it. Welcome to my race. That's a good title. And with that, I'm not going to ask you any more questions. We're going to end this interview. I want to thank you, and I want you to be blessed. And my next goal, so I've, I've hit one goal, which is to talk to you. My next goal is to shake your hand and hug you. Okay. Thank you very much for calling, cousin. All right. Thank you, cousin. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. Remember this. At the very least, when you look in the mirror after you get out of the shower, you have to love that person that's looking back at you. Because when you love yourself, you cannot help but understand who you are, where you are in this diaspora of being a human and love other people too. Till next time, love you all. Peace.